All right, imagine a situation with me. Imagine you're in a situation where you are in court because you have committed um, many serious, serious crimes and um, you are in place of getting the book thrown at you. And when the time comes and you stand before the judge um, and uh, you're ready to get what's coming to you, the judge looks at you and looks down at, you know, whatever papers and documents that are in front of him and says, you know, actually, um, I don't see any charges against you. You are free to go. What would your response, what would your reaction be? I'm sure it would be shock. Um, I'm sure that at some point you'd think, you know, there's got to be some sort of mistake. I committed the crimes and I'm expecting to do the time for it. So, you know, what's what's going on here? Well, put you put yourself in that situation as it relates to your salvation. Now, the now the illustration isn't altogether perfect. In fact, most illustrations aren't. But if we think about it and we understand what has happened to us now that we are in Christ Um, we understand that, you know, that we as sinners who know that we have sinned, we've sinned against the Holy God. We've sinned against the Holy God many, many times. And yet we are in a position where even though we have committed those many, many sins against the holy and righteous God, we are ones who have been given a verdict of not guilty forensically. We, we, I mean, we have been, we are guilty Um, but we are declared as people who are not guilty and we are declared as righteous. How in the world does something like that happen? Well, we'll talk about that um, in this episode as part of um, just kind of a handful of episodes I've been doing and just kind of getting back to the roots of things related to the gospel and um, and just re going over some of those things because it's never a bad idea to continue to talk about those things so that we're reminded more and more of what we have in Christ. So that's what we want to talk about on this episode. Uh, Some good things in store. I hope you stay with us. My name is Steve Gill, and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. Yeah, well, we are going to be talking about justification. I mean, basically, if we want to put the biblical term to what I was illustrating there, um, we're talking about justification, something that, um, I mean, if you've been a Christian for a while, I mean, that's not anything that that should be new to you at all. But even as it relates to this podcast, that's not anything that we are um, necessarily, that's not that's necessarily foreign to us. Um, you know, we've talked about, you know, justification, um, when we were all that time last year, when we were going through, uh, the book of Galatians, can you believe it? Ladies and gentlemen, it was about a year ago, um, around this time, a year ago that we started our study in, um, in Galatians. Now, of course we've been done with Galatians for a while. I think we finished in the middle of summer, I think, but even so it seems like I started Galatians just yesterday, <laughs> you know, um, which, you know, it's, you know, I guess the older you get, the time, the faster time goes. I, you know, I know I, I remember hearing that when I was younger and boy, do I, uh, do I, do I see the merits of that now? Um, you know, so it's, uh, um, time, time flies really fast and everything like that. But, you know, when we were talking about, when we were talking Galatians and going through Galatians, you know, the, the big theme that was, that was centered around that whole discussion was, you know, how is one made right with God? Um, and is it, you know, is it anything of us? Is it anything that we have to do any sort of ceremony that we have to perform or ceremonies, you know, maybe more than one, maybe something that's done on a, on, on a perpetual consistent basis. Um, you know, is it something where it's a continual moral thing or is it something, some, uh, something outside of us? You know, if you're a true Christian, if you're a true believer, you know the answer to that question. It's that's that uh, it's not anything of us. It's uh, it's uh, um, all having to do with Christ. Um, you know, by Christ alone, through faith alone, uh, and 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 grace alone. And um, you know, it's you know, it's 
uh, it's one of those things where like if you take the, the, the message of the gospel in its entirety and you just really read about it continually in scripture and you meditate on it, um, you know, more and more you're, you're confronted with the, with the whole idea of just how, how wonderful and how magnificent this whole thing is. Um, and especially, and this is going back to even what we talked about last time, uh, especially if you take into consideration the bad news from which we were, uh, we were drawn out of, we were drawn out of the, the bad news situation regarding our sin, um, and being trapped in, in, in the enslavement of our sin, um, and, um, and rescued from the consequences of sin. I mean, all of us. Uh, you know, me and all of you listening to this program right now are lawbreakers um, in more ways than one. Um, you know, it's not just a matter of we broke a law and that's the only thing that's happened. That's that, you know, that characterizes us as sinners, um, you know, and even if that was the case, that would still put us in deep, deep trouble. But the truth of the reality is, is that uh, we are by nature people who go against God and against his law, um, you know, and so. You know, something had to be done um, about that because without the intervention of Christ, we are, you know, we all are by nature objects of wrath and the wrath of God is something that was totally our due uh, because of our law breaking, because of our rebellion, because of our sinful habits and nature and lifestyle and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, but in Christ, what we have is the full payment of those sins. You know, and Jesus said uh, just as much on the cross right before he died. Uh, it is finished. It is paid in full. And what is the payment of those sins? How did how did that whole thing unroll? Um, you know, we talked about this a little bit last time, too, is that, you know, when we're talking about Jesus on the cross, we're not just talking about something physical and bodily that the Romans did to him and not to take away any of of the of the painful excruciating torture that he, that Jesus Christ went through. But, um, you know, you consider the fact that, you know, Jesus was was bearing our sins in his body on the tree. That's to borrow Peter's words from first uh, Peter chapter one um, or uh, I th- actually I think that's uh, that's chapter two, actually. Um, you know, and, you know, if he's bearing our sins on himself, what, I mean, what does that mean? What significance is there of that? Well, you know, again, to go back to the whole thing of what Jesus was, was praying in the garden of Gethsemane says, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And we talked about the cup, how the cup, you know, just based on what we see in other parts of scripture is, uh, you know, just an, another picture of the wrath of God and, and knowing and understanding that Jesus Christ drank down to the dregs, you know, the full brunt of God's wrath on our behalf. OK, so the wrath that was due for us, um, w- you know, Jesus Christ took that upon himself as he as he bore your sins and mine um, up on the cross. So he uh, as our substitutionary, uh, you know, a, a sacrificial victim, if you will. Um, you know, uh, took our sins in our place and received the full punishment of God um, in the, by experiencing the, the full brunt of God's wrath in our place um, and, and that sort of thing. And so if you just consider, you know, just all of that in, 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 its, in a whole, you, you understand that, that, you know, that's truly a magnificent thing. And even with what we're going to talk about now, what, what we're going to talk about on this episode um, is truly uh, is truly magnificent and amazing. Um, I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago the the whole idea of us being lawbreakers. That's going to be something that is incredibly important to remember and to understand um, as it relates to the justification of 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 Christ. Um, you know, because if we're if we're ones who are uh, are talking about you know we don't we aren't saved by our own merits. I mean, we're we're thinking and we're saying true things because the Bible tells us, you know, it's not based on anything that we do or anything, any merits that we're able to earn on our uh, on our own. Um, that's certainly not the case. But merits do play into the picture. The only, the only thing is, it's not our merits that play into it, right? And that's what we're talking. That's what we're talking about as it relates to to justification, uh, being made just, and and or being. Uh, declared righteous um, in the sight of God. 
Now, you might hear something like that and you might think, me, righteous? I mean, I, the, last, the last term that I would ever think of calling myself or considering myself is righteous. Um, but let me assure you um, that, uh, that you are, in the eyes of God, if you are in Christ, you are righteous. You are righteous before a holy God. Um, and that's a declaration that's made forensically. In other words, it's not anything that necessarily manifests itself perfectly 100% um, in, a, in a manifestation form, like in, in practical walking and living. I think that there is an improvement um, in our walk now that we're in Christ as opposed to before Christ, when we were living and dominated and enslaved totally by the flesh and we couldn't do anything for ourselves now, and well, we still can't do anything for ourselves, but the difference between before we came to Christ and now is that we have the residency of the Holy Spirit who resides in us and that we walk in his power and in his strength. Now, of course, we don't do the Christian life perfectly. Um, I'm first to admit that, and I'm sure that all of you in the uh, who are in Christ or listening to me right now agree with that wholeheartedly. Okay, <laughs> uh, you agree with that wholeheartedly. But um, you know, there's a difference now that we are in Christ, where we where we walk, um, we walk in the in the power and the strength um, of the uh, um, of the Holy Spirit. Um, but you know, we think about. Um, you know, being justified and being and being made right and declared righteous. Um, you know, like I said, in a practical sense, there is a difference from the time that we were before before Christ and now. But even now, our walk isn't perfect. Um, so as far as practical righteousness, we're not perfect in that sense. And we do unrighteous things. Uh, but there, but there will be a time, um, and this will be when Christ comes back, when that will be a reality. When both practically and forensically, we will be will be totally one hundred percent righteous, right? Um, but all that to say is that you you might hear me say something along the lines of, you know, you are righteous in God's sight, and you might say, I don't, I don't feel like I'm righteous. Again, understand that the righteousness that we're talking about here is a, is a forensic righteousness. It's not anything that is that is tied 100% to our practical walk in the here and now, um, but it's a declaration. It's something where something has been imputed to us, and we'll and, you know we'll talk about what that is here a little bit later. Um, but you know, it, it's it's a matter of we are declared right in God's sight. And because of that, you know, and, and based on the, on the authority of God's word and in the authority of scripture, um, you know, we can say that, um, that in a very real sense, we are righteous people in the sight of God. Okay. Now, how is any of that possible? Now, I understand that many of you listening to this program right now may know all too well what I'm talking about and you have you know, you know the directions that I'm going and everything like that. And I understand that. Um, and there may be many, uh, just as many people, maybe people who are new in the faith that, that, you know, that don't have as much knowledge of this and how this works. Um, so where, wherever you are in that spectrum, I, you know, just be patient with me. And especially if you, if you've been a Christian for a while and you know, you know, all of the biblical answers and things to that. And if, and if that especially is you don't tune out of this because we need to hear this again and again, we need to be reminded over and over and we have, and have the gospel preached to us over and over again so that it's continually embedded in our hearts and minds, the truth of the gospel and what's true of us and what our identity is in Christ. Now that we have received Christ by faith and that we now belong to him, um, you know, we can always have this whole idea of, you know, yeah, yeah, I know the gospel, you know, Jesus died for our sins, you know, justification, all that stuff. And then, you know, let's now move on. Um, how easy it is when we take that sort of mindset uh, to set ourselves up for deception um, when things in life don't go right or we feel distant from God. And then we start to question, you know, you know, God's uh, you know, you know, how God might look at us. I mean, especially if we're caught in a pattern of sin that we're not very happy with. And then we might start to question, you know, how could God love me 
um, or accept me and that sort of thing. The questions that, listen, those sorts of feelings and questions aren't foreign to us. I think all of us have been there. But when we're continually exposed to the truth of the gospel, we're reminded once again, ah, it's all because of what Christ has done. Okay. And that, and that's huge, uh, you know, as, as far as having that understanding continually planted in our hearts and our minds that will affect the way positively of how we live practically in the here and now. Okay. So that's why, that's why something like that is important. So I want to, I want to point out to you, um, a passage or a verse of scripture that, uh, you know, I think a lot of you, if you're familiar with scripture, um, are very familiar with, um, it's, it's probably a well-quoted, uh, well-known and, and frequently quoted, uh, verse of scripture, um, uh, that you've heard. I mean, again, if you've been a Christian for a while, again, if you're new to the faith, maybe you haven't heard it as much, but I mean, it's, it's a popular verse in scripture that strikes at the heart of what we're talking about as it relates to, um, as it relates to our justification. And that is second Corinthians chapter five, verse 21, where it says for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Did you catch that? That last part there so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. You know, we, we read about, you know, the whole thing of, of Christ's righteousness in other parts of scripture as well, most notably in the book of Romans. And I would, I would highly recommend, uh, you know, taking t- time if, if possible, even in one sitting to, uh, read through, uh, the book of Romans. Um, you know, if you, I mean, just reading about the righteousness of God, that's, that's ours in Christ Jesus, you know, just reading about justification all around Romans is a Romans is a big thing. Um, and we'll, and we'll actually look at a, a, a short passage in Romans here in a little bit, but there again, what I just read to you in second Corinthians five twenty one, it, you know, kind of gets to that, that, that the core of what we're talking about, um, um, in justification so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. And I would draw your attention to that whole thing of in him. This is something that's only available to those who are in Christ. Okay. In him, we might become the righteousness of God. Okay. Now, when we, when we consider the whole thing of justification, let's keep two things in mind, two things in mind that work together for us, you know, that to, in order for us to, to, to better understand and embrace this whole thing of what we call justification. All right. Number one, and we kind of, we kind of talked about this a little bit already a few minutes ago, so we don't need to belabor the point necessarily. Um, but number one, the whole thing is that all of us are sinners, right? Shocker, right? I, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm surprising anybody when I, when I, when I, when I, when I say that. And we, when we spent plenty of time last week talking about the seriousness of the sinfulness of man and, and our sin before coming to Christ and whatnot. We are people who continually lived and rebelled against God and we broke his law. Um, and we broke and and, it, and again, when we're talking about being, uh, you know, breakers of his law, the, 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 the big thing that we want to remember there is that we have sinned against a holy and righteous God. OK, so that our sin is something that is that uh, personally offends him. OK, so it's more than, you know, just something where we just broke a rule. I mean, we did technically break a rule, but we, but in large part, even bigger than that, we sinned against a holy and righteous God. And I think it's important that we look at it along those lines. But even here in, in second Corinthians five, and we're talking about, um, you know, this whole thing of, of us being sinners. Um, you know, we look at this, um, uh, you know, it says for, for our sake, he may, he made, uh, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that Jesus Christ became a sinner, uh, you know, or anything like that, or that he was sinful. But I think the key, ter- the key phrase as it relates to our sin, um, is found at the very beginning of verse 21, at least as it's laid out in the, in the ESV here, where it says for our sake. Okay. That term, you know, just kind of maybe in an indirect sense, um, and I don't know, maybe not so indirectly in other in other translations, depending on how it's worded. But here in the ESV, that gives us an understanding. If this is for our sake, that seems to suggest 
that if you know you know uh, he if Christ was uh you know um who knew no sin um you know made him to be sin on our behalf that seems to indicate that on our behalf or for our sake um was you know points to the reality that we were sinners and that there was a substitution that takes place that's why it's for our sake so that lays out all the more the reality and the truth that we are sinful creatures okay and here's the thing that's that's going to be important for us to understand is that when it comes to Christ and to the things of Christ and we're considering all those things there's there's a magnificent exchange that took place all right now we already know the the first part of that um and we talked about that a little bit a few minutes ago and even last time is that you know we as sinners and that's what we're talking about the the, the first element of this is uh, is us as sinners um our sin placed upon Jesus Christ right now that's a perfect segue into the second part of what we need to consider here as it relates to our justification um is that we are sinners and lawbreakers Christ is perfect and kept the law perfectly so think about this for a second our sin placed up on the perfect and holy and righteous son of god right and so you i mean even if you just kind of think about that for two seconds you understand just you know it blows your mind at least it blows my mind anyway um and you know scripture testifies to the fact that jesus is perfect right um you know jesus was made in every way as we are yet was um what yet was without sin um is something that the book of hebrews said specifically in hebrews uh in hebrews chapter four right um he's able to sympathize with our weaknesses when we are tempted because he was tempted in every way as he, as we are uh, as it says but you know the difference is is that he was without sin even from a from a human standpoint i mean when 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 jesus is before pilate and is dialoguing with pilate pilate is one who says i see no fault in this guy i see no fault in this man you know and so other people saw it too um, and so the perfection of Christ is something that's very important to take into consideration when we're talking about justification. Um, and especially as it relates to what we just said about ourselves before and that we are lawbreakers. You might not, you may or may not remember some of the things we talked about and some of the things that we went through um, in Galatians, but specifically in Galatians chapter 4, if you remember, one of the things that, that we read and we went over in Galatians 4 was verse 4 where it says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under law, under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now, in that passage, it talks about adoption. And we and we talked about adoption when we were going through that, when we were going through that passage. Um, but, keep, but underline in your mind that whole thing of, of Christ being born under the law. And he was born under the law for the purpose, verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law. Okay? Now, the fact that Jesus Christ, God incarnate, fully fully man, fully God, when he came to this earth, he was born under the law. That's a very significant thing that we're, that we're confronted with in Scripture. Because if the problem is, is that men and women, you and I, are lawbreakers, and and the fact that we break God's laws in in our sin is and our rebellion is what separates us from God. If we want the perfect sacrifice, the only perfect sacrifice that's going to do is somebody who's able to, under the same standards that that we are under, is able to come under that same standard and is able to live perfectly in a way that none of us have uh, none of us have ever been able to do no human being has ever been able to live under the under the under the uh, perfect standard of living under the law again the standard is perfection when it comes to when it comes to God's law and that's bad news for us is because all of us have failed miserably but Jesus Christ when he came to this earth he lived listen and we're even talking about we're even talking. We're talking about the whole package here. So not only moral, 
but keeping the 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 ceremonial um aspects of the law keeping all of those things and um you know the whole package of the law um that was given that was given um Jesus Christ came and he kept all of that perfectly so that you know as fully god and fully man we could all say um that he was a he was perfect in all things did not sin once has never sinned will never sin um and so therefore as far as uh the keeping of the law he was perfect okay and you know even when you read in the gospels and especially when you read in you know his uh you know being tempted by satan in the wilderness uh you know he was able to do what even adam was uh, was unable to do at the very beginning you know so you know that's why you have those people outside of christ um who are still under their federal head adam um he's the first adam but for us who are in christ we're in the last adam you know we are in the last Adam, the, the last Adam who was a type of, you know, or I guess you could say Adam who was a type of, you know, of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is, who is the last Adam. And so that just as we had, um, we lived under the consequences of sin brought on by the first Adam, in Christ we now have um, everything perfect um, uh, that's given to us and afforded to us in the last Adam because we are in him, okay? Which means that for somebody who kept the law perfectly, now we're, here, we're getting to the, to the root of, of what we're talking about with justification, is that we are credited with that righteousness that Christ lived when he lived perfectly under the law, Okay? And so think about the the weird exchange that I just that I just talked to you about before. We as sinners and lawbreakers had our sin placed on the perfect Son of God, so that His righteousness, His perfect righteousness, through faith, through our faith in Him, could be put on us, who are sinners, and who do who, and don't even come close to deserving um, uh, anything uh, of, of that magnitude from God in Jesus Christ. Okay, so that we are so so we so let's put it this way, so that when when Christ looks at uh, when God looks at us, when God looks at us, he doesn't see a helpless worm of a sinner. He doesn't. He sees the perfect righteousness of his son that has been credited to our sin account. Isn't that isn't that wonderful? Isn't that neat? Isn't that gracious? Again, that's not anything that we, that you and I deserved. Um, you know, if anything, we deserved uh, you know condemnation and hell. I I told you I would I would bring up uh, a thing or two from Romans uh, that that points this out as well. You know, and you look at you know the first three and a half uh, chapters of the book of Romans, and it's pretty depressing because it lays out uh, you know the uh, the sinfulness of man, which is something that was true of all of us. I mean, you can you can get a summarized view of that of what we looked at in the first few verses of Ephesians chapter two. But even so, uh, you know, just consider uh, you know if we were to look at um, Romans chapter two, um, and Paul says in verse seventeen and following, he says, "But if you call yourself a Jew," and rely on the law and boast in God. Now, now keep that term in your mind. Yeah, you know, if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God. You know, that was one of the things that that, you know, many Jews in that day and many Jews today and even outside of the Jewish world, you know, people if they have any sort of religious thought or mindset, you know, they they have this idea of living by a certain standard whether that's you know, the Ten Commandments, which they think that they are able to live under, or maybe they create their own standards that they think is moral, um, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, there's a reliance of some sort on, on the law or a, or a set of rules or something that uh, supposedly determines morality. Um, and, you know, here what Paul is saying in verse 17, it says, if you rely on the law and boast in God, and boast in God, and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law and if you are and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind a light to those who are in darkness an instructor of the foolish a teacher of children 
having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? Now, here's where, you know, Paul is really laying out the challenge of people who might hold that sort of mindset, might hold that sort of position, because somebody might lock themselves up and put themselves up on a pedestal and say that I'm a good person in keeping the law and I instruct other people how to live like me and how to live according to the law and think that by all of this that they're that they're good in God's sight. But he says, but yeah, but wait a minute, you who, who teach uh, others, don't you teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? See, here's the whole thing of the of the whole use of the law uh, that we're talking about here that shows other people just how fall how far short they've fallen. You know, we could we could say that we do good here, here, or here, but the truth and reality is. We might have a we might have in our minds a, a, a proper, you know, mindset of, of, of morality. But the thing is, do we live under that morality as we ourselves are supposed to? As it relates to, you know, even what we see in the Ten Commandments, as it's laid out here, I think the implied answer to that question is nobody really does, because even the people who teach along those lines, they are ones who are lawbreakers as well. Verse 23, as it says, you, you who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of the, the name of God is blasphemed among Gentiles because of you. OK, now I want to skip forward here to chapter three. I mean, that's just a little part of the first three and a half chapters um, uh, of Romans where we're given the, the bad news. And it's laid out for us there that we are sinners and that we're due for God's wrath. That is, that is our due outside of Christ. But if you're in Christ, something very interesting happens. So in verse 21 of chapter three, it says, but now in, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Okay, so and, you know, it, the, the verse even goes on to say, for there is no distinction. And then verse 23, uh, a verse that we're all familiar with, for, familiar with, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And remember what we talked about as far as all sinning and falling short of the glory of God. We've, we've fallen short of the perfect standard, which is God himself and the glory that he manifests. Right. So, you know, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Um and are justified, now verse 24, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, okay? So again, taking that all familiar verse for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, but that continues and are justified by his grace. So you have the sin problem, but you have the great news in verse 24 that, that talks about our justification. And notice that it says there that uh, that we, it says that we are justified by his grace. Okay. And certainly that is gracious. You know, it's something that again, is not anything that we ourselves have merited. We, we usually refer to grace as unmerited favor. Okay. It's not anything of our merits. There's no merits that we could perform that would make ourselves right with God. Now, but as I said before, it's not based on our merits, but is based on merits of another, right? And the merits of the of another is that is the one Jesus Christ, through whom we are justified. And so that's why that's how you get into the whole thing of what Paul is mentioning in this section in Romans, where he's talking about the righteousness of God. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested. Okay, so there's that imputation. I'm going to use that word because you know when whenever justification is is spoken of you know we, you, you might hear the word imputed it's usually it, it's it's more of a banking term it, it, it's it's talking about something that's credited to us um or counted or or reckoned unto us um you know something you know that you know just something that's that's reckoned to us or imputed or or credited to us and so basically when in justification um Christ's righteousness is credited to our account. Let's put it that way. So that's that's where you get to the whole thing of when God sees you, what he sees is the perfect righteousness of Christ. He sees the perfect righteousness of his son. You know, the whole thing of credited or counted to, 
I mean, that's not anything that's just invented in New Testament terms. I mean, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, even if you remember from our study of Galatians, when we were talking about Abraham, this came up. You know, you know what, what was mentioned back in, in Genesis chapter 15, of which Paul quotes um, later on in Galatians and a couple other places too, where it says, you know, it says Abraham believed God and it was counted or credited to him as righteousness. So justification is something that, you know, that that was a thing even uh, even in the times of Abraham. And you especially know that from uh, from the New Testament when you read the next chapter of Romans in Romans chapter four. We don't have to go uh, through that whole passage there anyway. But um, well, actually, let me just read. Let me just read the first handful of verses of Romans chapter four, just so you get it. Can, you can get a, a more sure idea of what we're dealing with here. Um, in Romans chapter four, where it says, um, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by words, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So there again is another quote there. I mentioned it's in Galatians. You read it here um, in, uh, um, in, uh, in, in, in Romans here. Now the one who uh, now to the one who works his wages are are not counted as a gift but as his due, and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly his faith is counted as righteousness. So there again the whole thing of it's not anything that you work for you know it, it all comes through faith and believing. And to that person who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. And then he, here he quotes from he quotes from Psalm uh, Psalm thirty two here, um, where it says um, uh, where he says blessed is uh, blessed are those whose whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So when we're talking about justification, you know, it's off the record. Your sins are no longer taken into account. They've been wiped clean. They've been paid for. And what's, been, what's also been put into your sin account, again, is the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ. So you get credited for the righteousness that Christ lived on your behalf. That's very interesting because we a lot of times we, we, we think and we say Christ died for our sins, which he did. You know, but Christ also lived for us as well. If you really want to, if you really want to know the truth, he died for us and he also lived for us, lived for us in the sense that he was born under law. He kept the law perfectly and that perfect righteousness under the law is credited to us who were not, who were not able to, uh, we're not able to keep the law, uh, for ourselves. Okay. And so that's what you have there. Think of it like this. And here's an illustration that I always like to use. Um, it's not a perfect illustration, again. Um, uh, but again, I think all illustrations have their have their holes, you know, here or there. But you know, if you were if you were taking a class, let's say you were taking a college class, use your imagination of what it is. Um, and in the introduction to the class, and even what's written in the syllabus and everything. Um, it said that in this class, the only way that you can pass this class is if you pass the one test in this class at the end of the semester and you get a 100%, a passing grade is a 100%. So that, and that's your only grade. There's, you know, there's nothing else into that's into consideration, no homework, you know, projects or anything like that. All lecture. And at the end of the semester, you take that, you take that exam. And in order to pass, you have to get a 100%. Otherwise, you fail. So that means 99%, then you're done. You, 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 you fail, and you have to retake the class over. It seems pretty, it seems pretty strict, right, um, for a classroom setting or anything like that. Hopefully, none of you have ever encountered anything like that. Um, so you, know, you take the test, and you, know, you, you try your hardest. You study your hardest, and 
uh, but you've never been able to get 100%. You, you've gotten what you think is a good enough score. You've gotten 94, you've gotten an 87, you've gotten you know all these sorts of things. Other people, maybe not so much, 67, 59, whatever like that. But no matter what the case is, whether you've got a 50% or a 67% or a 99%, it's not 100%. And so you flunk. Now, and you retake this class over and over. Let's assume that this is a class that you need. Um, until somebody steps forward, it's just some random person who steps forward and says, here's what I'd like to do for you. I would like to take the exam for you. And let's just say, I know this is unrealistic, but let's just say that the professor allows this. And he says, I want to take the test for you. And so come the end of, of another semester where all the, everything is, is, is given comes exam day. And instead of you taking the exam, this other person takes the exam for you. All right. And that person who took that exam got a 100%. Now he did that, not you. He did that. He took the exam and he got 100%. And now he says, now that I got that 100%, I'm, you know, the professor is now going to credit that 100% to you. Now, again, you didn't take the exam, right? Somebody else took it for you and got the perfect score. And now you pass that course because now that 100% is credited to your grade, right? And that's what, we're, that's what we're talking about where we're talking about justification and the imputation of Christ's righteousness, okay? Now, like I said, the illustration isn't perfect because in all reality, it's not impossible for somebody to get 100% on that exam. In the spiritual world, as it relates to righteousness, it's impossible for us to live perfect righteousness in order for us to, quote unquote, pass the test in order to make ourselves right before God and, and worthy of heaven. OK, that's where the illustration kind of breaks down. But hopefully you get the gist of what I'm talking about here in that, you know, Christ, quote unquote, took the test in the sense of he came was born under the law. He kept the law perfectly, something that you and I were not, were, were not and have never been able to do. And then after his resurrection and through faith and our faith in him, he credits us with the perfect righteousness of Christ. That 100% grade under the law is now ours. It's been that grade is now, is now credited to us so that we pass. But we didn't take the exam. I mean, we didn't take the perfect exam. And um, and get a perfect score that Christ did and Christ's perfect score is now is now credited to us. And that's what and that's what you have in justification. All right. And so this isn't and, and I want you to understand that this isn't anything that's just sort of uh, a theory or anything like that. But when I say that when God sees you, he sees the perfect righteousness of his son. I truly mean that that's real. Now, that's not to say that God doesn't see our, our, our struggles and our failings and everything in the here and now, you know, as we're working through the process of sanctification. But what I'm saying is, is that when Christ sees you, he doesn't see a, 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 a worthless, uh, struggling sinner who can't get his stuff together. The way that he sees you and reckons you and looks at you and loves you is as you know, is in the is in the is in the form of you know the perfect righteousness of his son, which is applied to you. So he doesn't see the struggling Steve Gill; he sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's what he sees, and that's why justification is so amazing. Okay, um, I mentioned the the illustration before about um, being in the courtroom. Um. And again, that illustration isn't perfect either, but let's put ourselves back in that, in that situation again, but let's put the spiritual aspects to this, uh, to that, um, as well. If we are standing before standing in God's court, guilty as all get out because we are guilty of sin and rebellion and wickedness and lawlessness and everything like that. Um, and then if we put this in salvation terms um, and in justification terms, when we're standing before the judge, you know, but, but pick yourself in the courtroom scene, the George, the, the judge looks down at the charges that are, that have been brought up against you. Now, 
in a, in a very real sense, if we're looking at a list of charges, there should be a long, 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 long list of stuff against us. But the judge looks down, and all he sees is you know nothing, nothing. And he's like, I don't, I don't see any charges against you. I don't. There's not one single charge written against you of which you should be charged. Now, if we take that a step further, I mean, that's one way of looking at it, but we can take this a step further in a biblical manner and say that instead of on the sheet of paper, instead of seeing like a blank, blank pieces of paper, what we see is righteous, 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 written all over that page and all in all the other pages that come after that. So that not only do you not see charges against you in that court of law, but you see a whole bunch of merits added to your account. So the judge says, I don't see any guilt here. In fact, I see a lot of merit and righteousness, and you are free to go, right? That's what you're dealing with as it relates to, as it relates to justification. Merits that, again, that, are, that aren't yours. There's somebody else's merits on your behalf. Okay. Perfect merits. Not just random merits of somebody else who does good things here but does bad things, you know, somewhere else. That doesn't do. That's why Christ had to be perfect. And that's the way Christ is perfect because he is God. That's why any, any other person who's a sinner isn't able to pull off what Christ did. Because again, remember what the standard what the standard is. The standard is perfection. And only one person was able to live perfectly under that perfect standard, and that's Jesus Christ. And so he's able to fulfill the perfect standard that you and I don't even come close to meeting. That's what you have. And so if we really think about it along those lines, and I don't know how often we really think uh, we talk in these terms as it relates to our salvation. Our salvation talk is a lot of times just kind of like, yeah, Christ died for our sins and I'm forgiven. I mean, and that's great and that's true. There's nothing wrong with that. We re- we read about the forgiveness of God in in, uh, in chapter 4 of Romans when Paul was quoting from uh, David there in the Psalms. Blessed is the man whose sin is sin is forgiven and whose sin is covered, right? Um, but I mean, if you just think about the magnificence of the exchange, our sins were placed on one on one who did not deserve it so that through faith in him, we could receive the righteousness that we don't deserve that's credited to us. Okay. So if you want to talk about grace and being justified by grace, as Paul says there in, in Romans chapter three, you understand all the more just how those words make sense. Justified by grace? Yes, absolutely. Because I received something that that isn't mine, but I'm credited for. And because of that credit, that's, you know, the righteousness that's credited to me. I am now right and I am just in the sight of God. Okay. So the next time, you know, if you're, if you're going through some sort of struggle and it's eating up, uh, uh, eating up at you spiritually, which I might remind you that, that, that goes along with the new nature, as we've talked about in, in episodes past, remember the promises that are laid out in scripture and, and the truth of what's laid out in scripture, what is true of you before God through Jesus Christ? Because the one thing that, that the evil spiritual realm loves to do is plant those doubts in our minds as far as, or not, maybe not even planting doubts, you know, maybe in some cases, but very conveniently making us forget who we are in Christ and what Christ has done and it's not about what what we do, but what has been done for us. And because of what's been done for us, how God the Father sees us because we are in his son, Jesus Christ. Okay. It's very, and that's why I say it's important for us to preach these things and teach these things um, frequently so that we're reminded over and over again, because it's very easy to slip into forgetfulness because we think along human terms, um, and we think that because of our slip up here and our, and our failure there, oh my goodness, God is no longer pleased with me. How could God love me? You know, those sorts of things. No, if you understand the truth of the gospel in all of its glory, you, you, you rejoice 
you, you still grieve over your sin. I mean, that's that's part of it. There's nothing wrong with with being sorrowful over our sin. But when we start when when we start to wallow in that sorrow, and then we start to and that sorrow starts to, uh, and our wallowing in that sorrow begins to affect the way we think about God and how we think God thinks of us. Then that might be a little bit of a problem. That's why we need to be deeply rooted in those things. And by all means, it's not an inappropriate thing for us to revisit, you know, the wonderful truths about the gospel. And that's and that's why something like this, what we've been talking about today and in times and and in episodes past over the last handful of weeks, I think is something that's very important. Okay, so that's justification. That's all I really want to lay out and 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 just kind of expound on as it relates to that. I hope I've I've hope I hope I've made that clear. I hope that's been a, a clear enough presentation um, of what of what Scripture says. Of course, there can there's a lot more that can be said. A, a lot of other passages that can be explored and talked about. But I think for our purposes, um, what we've talked about is sufficient, and so we'll leave it there for now, um, and we'll continue our discussion of the gospel. Uh, next time, probably. Um, I'm thinking there's maybe one more route that I want to go down um, as far as talking about that. And don't forget, um, real soon on this podcast, we're going to we're gonna start our next book study, um, which is going to be the Gospel of John. So it should be a good time uh, going into that. That'll be coming up really soon. So, But for right now, we'll leave things here for now. If you enjoy this program and you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on Apple Podcasts, also on iHeartRadio, YouTube, or Spotify. You can also follow me, Steve Gill, on X. The handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S E R I P T S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. And also my other account at LT Scripts Pod. That's L T S E R I P T S P O D. And also, if you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to order a copy of my book, Signs of the End What Did Jesus Say About His Own Return and the Events That Point to It, a book about Jesus' words to his disciples. On the Olivet Discourse, Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21. You can order that on Amazon.com, um, Amazon.com or BarnesNoble.com, and um, possibly some other places as well, probably. Um, but I would encourage you to order a copy. I hope you read it, and I hope that you're blessed by it. All right, friends. Well, I had a great time uh, discussing uh, justification with all of you. I hope that it was encouraging and helpful and profitable to all of you who are listening. My name is Steve Gill, and I will see you right back here next time.